Good morning. This is Faith at Faith and Books. I'm in my car because you have to be careful what you wish for because the weather warmed up and it turns out that our screen porch is just invaded with stink bugs. Um, and we had a really bad, um, you know, it's not invasion, infestation years ago. And we've always had a minor problem, but the minute it warmed up, there's like 40 stink bugs flying around my screen porch. And every time I open the sliding door, one flies in. And they're, they're really gross. They get in my hair. And oh, I can't stand them because when we first had the infestation, they were all over the screen porch. And they even got into our chimney in our family room. And we had to... I kept reading. Like in the Washington Post, they would say... It was when they were first got into this area that... You couldn't do anything. There was no poison that would kill them or whatever. You know, there was no treatment. And so they just kept getting worse and worse. And I kept just trying to catch them and flush them. Um, we even bought this special bug vacuum cleaner, but it didn't work because it would make them stink. And I can't stand the smell. It smells like rotting cilantro to me. Just, ugh. Um, but anyway, then, but then I talked to a friend. She said, no, you can call the, call the pest company. So I did, and they came out, and they killed them. And um, I had to clean up, though it took like a day for the, for the whatever to take effect. And I had to sweep up hundreds and hundreds of dead and dying stink bugs. And the stink was horrible. I kept having to run into the house, retching, trying to throw up from the smell. So I really got traumatized by stink bugs. And, you know, every year we have a few... You know, we're always dealing with, with them in a minor way, and I'm okay with that, but it's gotten to a bad point. I, I don't even want to go on my screen porch, which is like my favorite place uh, at this time of the year. But um, I have I have the pest guy coming this afternoon, so he's going to do an assessment because this is like an extra thing. We have a contract, but this is an extra thing because I guess the screen porch is outside the house, not in the house. Anyway, that is why I'm sitting in my car. Um, but I'm doing my last installment um, of McClure's for May, and I'm doing the next chapter, chapter four, An Unholy Alliance um, by Ida Tarbell, and it's from her a History of the Standard Oil Company. Um, and what this is what happens next. Now, I'm not going to get to finish the story, but we know the ending. We know Rockefeller comes out. In the end, he is the richest, one of the richest men. And he made it from, um, from oil. So he does wind up taking over the whole oil industry. Um, but he had a lot of, I mean, he kept trying. He's very uh, perseverant. And he kept trying and he kept failing. And then every time though he would get a little bit more of an edge and then he would try again and he'd get a little bit more of an edge and then finally he succeeded in taking over the whole thing. Um, but um, in this um, in this chapter she talks about his, his uh, let's see, is this his second attempt? So he tried the secret conspiracy with the railroad um, using the um, the front, thank you, spontaneous reader, uh, the company, uh, South Improvement Company, that fell apart, raised lots and lots of issues. So then he decides to come back and openly say, okay, let's form an organization and um, together, you know, we'll form this organization. You all can be stockholders and we'll control the oil industry. And that way we can control prices and we can control control. Uh, 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 what's the word I want, corruption, that sort of thing. Even though he was basing the whole idea on corruption because it was all based on the idea that the railroads would never play straight and they would, if you had um, more to ship, you would get, they would give you a discount, even though they weren't supposed to because they were public carriers and they were supposed to treat everybody equally. Um, um, Rockefeller was counting on the fact that they were corrupt and they would give them a, a special deal. So, um, so he comes back to the Pennsylvania oilmen and they come up with something called the Pittsburgh plan. And he's got this whole idea of how he's going to do it. But the same guy who had sort of led the union against the South Improvement Company plan, his name's Hassan, William, 
William Hassan, was it? No. Anyway, his last name was Hassan. He says, no, this isn't right. Um, I don't trust you, and it's based on, on corruption, so it would, it's not going to work. And so he tries to lead a fight, and he starts another organization called the <clears throat> um, Producers... What is it called? The Petroleum Producers Agency, I think it was called, or Association. And uh, and so, and then um, Rockefeller's group forms the refiners. Um, oh, what am I trying to say? The refine, uh, the Petroleum Refiners Agency. So you've got these two groups now, and they're trying to get a contract between them. And it causes all sorts of troubles, including a 30-day shutdown of producing oil. There's all these complications. But finally, they cave, because some people are going over to Rockefeller's way of thinking. Finally, they cave, and they have a, uh, a contract. And everything s seems like it's going great. Um, and then, of course... Rockefeller uh, double crosses them, and suddenly he can't pay the amount that he wanted that they wanted him to pay, because what happened was the oil produced. There were two things that were going on. The the they had saturated the market basically. There was they they were producing more oil. You know they were getting better and better at producing oil, and so they were producing more oil than there was actually demand for. And they couldn't control, they, well, they were in this agency or, or association of petroleum producers, they were controlling most of them. They, they were wildcats, she calls them, that were, were starting up and selling outside of their little arrangement. And then also Europe had caught on, and now they were starting to produce oil. So, um, so there was this competition, there was a glut, and they couldn't keep the price up. But the contract was at a particular price level because, and Ida points this out, that um, because the oil men had gotten rich so fast, they really had an unrealistic expectation of how much money they should be making. You know, it's one of those curve things, right? So when they first started out, everything was going up, 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 and now it's sort of plateauing. And, uh, and they're dissatisfied with this. They think that something's up and that they should be able to be getting the profits they were, they were getting initially. So, um, so that was going on. So, um, anyway, so the, the two associations, the one for the producers that were the largely the oil regions in Pennsylvania and the refiners who were largely in Cleveland under Rock, uh, Rockefeller, they had what they called the Treaty of Titusville and, um, and they signed that and then, um, and then it turns out that they can't that Rockefeller reneges on it. So I'll read a little bit of this. Let me see if I can see it. The light's pretty good here. Uh, the refiners spring their trap. And now at last, after five months of incessant work, the agency was ready to begin disposing of oil. They set to work at once to apportion the 200,000 barrels the refiners had bought among the different districts. It was a slow and irritating task, for a method of apportionment and of gathering had to be devised, and as was to be expected, it aroused more or less dissatisfaction and many charges of favoritism. The agency had the work well underway, however, and had shipped about 50,000 barrels when in Jan on January 14th, it was suddenly announced that the refiners had refused to take any more of the contract oil. There was a hurried call of the producers, council, and a demand for an explanation. A plausible one was ready from Mr. Rockefeller. Quote, you have not kept your part of the contract. You have not limited the supply of oil. There is more being pumped today than ever before in the history of the region. We can buy all we want at $2.50, and, and I think he had contracted for $3.75 or something like that. And oil has sold within the week as low as $2. If you will not or cannot stop overproduction, can you expect us to pay your price? We keep down the output of refined, so he's controlling the refined oil, and so keep up the price. If you will not do the same, you must not expect high prices. So they couldn't do anything about it, right? They were, they were trapped and, and apparently Rockefeller had seen that this was gonna be the result and they, they hadn't. He was, I mean, he was so 
good at, at seeing the big picture and, and, and thinking through all the consequences. Oh, it's starting to rain. Wait a second, let me, let me close my window. There we go. I'm getting, I'm getting the, my, my book wet. Um, oh, yeah, it's, it's raining. It's warm, though. It's really warm out. Okay, um, so... So what are they going to do about that? Well, both associations wind up collapsing. Um, and <clears throat> But Mr. Rockefeller has managed to um, make money. Again, he's always making money. And he takes all his profits and he puts them into things like making his own barrels. Like he doesn't want to be dependent on anybody. He wants to control every aspect of the oil business. And that's what he keeps working towards slowly but surely. Um, and he just sort of, he's just really clever and he manages to take every, you know, um, every obstacle and turn it to his advantage. So the chapter winds up with this, um, this final paragraph. Mr. Rockefeller uh, meditates plan number three. It was not to be expected that Mr. Rockefeller, having reaped such rewards from his connection with the short-lived self-improvement company, would give up the idea of combination because the National Refiners Association had failed. As a matter of fact, he was about to enter on a bolder scheme of, con of conquest than either of the others in which he had been a guiding spirit in the last 18 months. Did I read that right? As a matter of fact, he was about to enter on a bolder scheme of conquest than either of the others in which he had been a guiding spirit in the last 18 months. Okay, so that's that, and I'm not gonna be able to continue this exciting story. Um, I'm really tempted to buy the book. I mean, you can get the um, original hardback, but they're like $500 of this. It's a two volume set, so. Um, so that's, you know, but Dover Publications has a kind of redacted uh, paperback. So I'm sort of, maybe I'll just get that. But let me see, I'm, I'm just trying to look ahead. Okay, so the next chapter, the title is The Price of Trust Building. So what goes on there? Lots of pictures. And I don't want to bore you too much. And then the last chapter that I am not getting to, but it's included in my in my uh, compilation here is uh, chapter six: the defeat of the Pennsylvania. Oh, he's building pipelines. So good. Anyway, it's interesting. I'm I'm very proud of Ida Tarbell for doing what she did. And I would like to get um, when I'm buying books again. I think I might go for the Dover publication, um, the Dover uh, edition of this whole book. Um, so that's that. Do I have anything else to say? Oh yeah, well I think I I call this a success. The May is for Magazine. I had other people participating which was great and I have only sort of touched the surface of my own collection. I can go back and I could focus on stories by Rudyard Kipling or Bret Hart or uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. I could go back. There's a whole bunch of them on coal mining, which, you know, my grandfather was a coal miner. I come from a long line of coal miners. So I um, I would like to read about that. That would be really interesting. They have one called Right to Work. and um, So that would be super interesting to focus on. So I might do this again next May. I think it, it would be fun to do. So... So my, my last installment of Mayus for Magazine is going to be on Sunday where I'm going to wrap up um, talking about Integrity Magazine. So that's it for this morning. Um, I hope you're doing well. I'm feeling, you can see my rash. I still, I should cover that up. I still, and I, it broke out a little bit in other <laughs> places. I don't know. I mean, a rash really seems to be part of the uh, COVID thing. <clears throat> Who knows? I don't know. Anyway, take care. Um, and I will talk to you later. Bye.